Good morning. Um, first of all, it's just fantastic to be here with with this group of individuals. It's great to be at the PillNet conference, and I'm really honored to be able to speak here. I've already, in just the few days that I've been here, learned a great deal that I feel like we can take back to the field. Um, I'm a recruiter, and my whole remarks today are gonna be about recruiting other pro bono lawyers and others who are not lawyers. We heard yesterday about barefoot lawyers and paralegals um, to join the movement of trying to support refugees and offer protection to the 21 million refugees in the world. Um, I'm probably going to read a little more today than usual just because I'm quoting some people and I want to make sure that I have the quotes accurate. So to you, I, I'll share with you five examples illustrated by cases that we've handled in the field in the Middle East and Jordan because I want to use very concrete examples of ways that pro bono lawyers and public interest lawyers can serve refugees. I think it's an unusual area. I often hear from lawyers, but how do we get into the field? How do we find the clients? What can we do to help? And so I'm gonna use some illustrations of cases to give some examples from our own experience. <clears throat> Two years ago, I interviewed a teenage boy in Jordan. He was 16 when the Syrian revolution started. He was living in Dara, which is a place in Syria where the uprising began. He wasn't political. He wasn't one of the teenagers who painted slogans on the walls of his school. He was just a boy, and he was swept into an apocalyptic war. The first year of the war, he was captured by the Syrian regime, and he was tortured. The second year, his father and brother were imprisoned and tortured. The third year, with bombs falling all around Dara, he fled to a refugee camp in Jordan. When I interviewed him, he said, I feel like someone threw me from a mountain. When I leave the house, I feel torn into pieces. I feel like my legs got crushed, and I can't walk. I have dreams about what I witnessed in Syria. I dream about dead bodies and injured people. I dream about the army and the officers who arrested me. Sometimes I dream I am being tortured. When I wake up, I feel pain in the place I was tortured in the dream. Sometimes an airplane flies overhead in Jordan, and I hear the same airplane in my dreams. When I wake up, I feel like I lost one of my limbs. I see dead bodies in my dreams, and when I wake up, I start looking for those bodies in my room. I don't know where I am. I don't feel safe. UNHCR told Ahmad that he doesn't qualify for refugee protection because he's a single male and he doesn't fit any of the vulnerability categories that they prioritize. There are over 21 million refugees in the world. 99% of them will never qualify for resettlement. They'll remain trapped in a black hole, unable to move forward, unable to return to their countries of origin, and unable to heal. It's rare for a refugee to have a lawyer the prevailing myth is that UNHCR occupies the field of refugee protection and there's no role for outside legal counsel. This myth needs to be shattered. Lawyers are well positioned to represent refugees like Ahmad, document their torture history, develop evidence of their vulnerability, present their case to UNHCR for resettlement, and if failing that, present their case to other governments that are willing to offer humanitarian protection to refugees. Reed Smith is handling 60 refugee cases in Jordan, cases of torture, persecution on account of sexual identity, sexual gender-based violence, and medical cases. Each case requires collaboration and legal strategy with UNHCR and governments around the world. We've succeeded in relocating clients to the UK, Canada, France, Germany, the United States, and we keep fighting. There are nearly 700,000 refugees in Jordan alone. Pro bono lawyers can make a difference in the lives of those refugees, and we'll tell you more about that this afternoon in one of our sessions. About half of our cases involve victims of torture. We also have expertise in cases involving gender-based violence. Hulud is a 20-year-old widow from Syria. She was living in a refugee camp in Jordan with her twin six-year-old daughters when two men broke into her caravan. She told me, they put their hands on my mouth and pushed me inside. They told me to take off my clothes. I resisted and they beat me. My daughter woke up and asked why they were beating me. I told her it was because I didn't go and get them water. A few days later they returned and told me I had to give them what they wanted or they would kill my children. I didn't resist. The next day I took my children and I escaped the camp. Refugees who escape the camps in Jordan are prohibited from accessing UNHCR cash assistance. They're denied access to health care, and they are not eligible for refugee resettlement. Alude had no way to pay her rent, she had no way to buy food for her children, and she had no way to survive. 
It's possible to petition the UNHCR and Jordanian authorities for permission for someone to be outside of a refugee camp. But refugees are not informed of this process, nor can they navigate the process alone. Halud needed an advocate to document the violence she suffered and prepare a petition on her behalf. This is another example of how pro bono and public interest lawyers can provide direct help to vulnerable refugees. We've also supported women seeking access to justice after suffering gender-based violence. More than five million Syrian refugees are living in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. Most lack access to food, shelter, mental health care, and medical care. According to UNHCR, refugee protection is successful if a refugee has access to one of three durable solutions, safe repatriation to their country, integration in the host country where they've fled to, or resettlement to a third country. Syrians can't repatriate to Syria right now. They're not given permanent Syrian legal status in Jordan, Lebanon, or Turkey, and only 1% are ever resettled anywhere else in the United States. I think it's fair to say that our refugee resettlement and protection system is a total failure. There's no pathway. This grim reality forces refugees to take their life into their own hands. In 2015, we saw a massive migration from Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and other countries, North Africa and the Middle East, through the Mediterranean on rubber boats to Greece, and we're seeing the same migration now into Italy. According to UNHCR, more than 1.5 million refugees have arrived in Europe by sea over the last two and a half years. Last summer, we sent teams of lawyers to the Greek islands to represent refugees at risk of deportation back to Turkey. We counseled hundreds of refugees on their legal rights under the EU-Turkey agreement, which specifically contemplates involvement of foreign lawyers in Greece. We rotated 30 pro bono lawyers into Greece over four months, supported by 40 interpreters and case assistants. While interviewing refugees in Greece, we documented case after case of the tragic consequences of forced migration by sea. One refugee told me, on March 7th, 2016, I took a rubber boat with about 65 other refugees. The boat was too full. There were refugees sitting on the edges and it collapsed. I fell into the water with the other refugees. There were many children on the boat. Many of the children drowned. I was holding two children on my back, but I could not hold more because I would have drowned myself. Until this moment, I still think about what happened and all of the children who drowned. This memory comes into my head all of the time, and I can't make it go away. Since 2015, there have been more than 12,000 deaths in the Mediterranean. Since the beginning of 2017, there have been 2,784 deaths in the Mediterranean. Many refugees make five or ten attempts on rubber boats before they make it to shore. In this photo, these two little girls made 12 attempts before they safely made it to the shores of the Greek island of Lesbos. Many describe how border patrols have shot at their engines, deliberately created waves to capsize their boats, or Ill illegally pushed them back to Turkish waters after they had arrived in Greek territories. These are violations of international law. Pro bono lawyers can support human rights groups in Greece and Italy and other countries seeking to hold those countries accountable for these violations. Another area where lawyers can hold states accountable involves conditions in refugee camps. Last week, a six-year-old girl died in the camp of Moria in Lesbos, Greece. She had arrived by boat a few days earlier. She was gravely ill. Although Greek officials registered her arrival, they failed to ensure she had access to medical care. Her family took her to UNHCR and to health clinics on the island, but they could not access care. The child died just days after her arrival in Europe. Last winter, seven refugees died in Moria as a result of a failed winterization program. There are 5,500 refugees detained in Moria. Some have been there for more than a year. Conditions in the camp violate every one of the United Nations conventions. There are four security guards for over 5,000 refugees. There are reports of a sex ring operating in the camp. Rape is prevalent. There are no provisions to protect women and girls from sexual violence. Disabled refugees are left to their own defenses. Last year, a paralyzed refugee from Iraq was sleeping on a piece of cardboard, and other refugees he did not know were helping him to get food and to use the toilet. Last week, during a meeting in Athens, the regional director of UNHCR urged me to encourage private lawyers like us to undertake strategic litigation related to unlawful camp conditions in Greece. 
Greek lawyers are overwhelmed and they're under siege. They have 5,500 refugees on the island of Lesbos alone and there are about 10 lawyers on the island to handle those cases. This year our firm is embedding a team of Greek and international lawyers within Doctors Without Borders in Greece. Doctors refer high-risk cases to our lawyers and the lawyers will develop legal strategies for protection. Pro bono lawyers could add capacity, document violations of human rights standards, advocate for safer conditions, and prevent deaths like the six-year-old last week. There are dozens of additional ways that pro bono lawyers can serve refugees and protect their rights. Our lawyers have used international law to challenge involuntary hospitalizations in psychiatric clinics for individuals who are suffering from acute PTSD as a result of war or torture. We have represented individuals seeking informed consent in healthcare settings. We've made complaints on behalf of women who are victims of violence. We've facilitated family reunification for unaccompanied minor refugees. Imagine if you have 21 million potential clients facing daily violations of their human rights. These individuals need legal counsel. In closing, I would emphasize the following key points. We must reimagine refugee protection and push beyond traditional UNHCR frameworks that lack the elasticity required for the current challenge. We must think of lawyering in a more holistic way, supporting doctors and psychologists and social workers and community advocates in their effort to protect refugees. We must see beyond borders and jurisdictional limits and think of refugee protection as a global issue governed by universal human rights law. We must reject the commodification of refugees, which allows states and international bodies to portray the challenge as a funding issue beyond resolution. Refugee protection has become a political issue and we must challenge the xenophobic political discourse that dehumanizes refugees and brands them as dangerous and parasitic. Lawyers are a critical part of the key to refugee protection. We must show up, boots on the ground, and be prepared to serve. Thank you.